Matthew chapter 2 is where we're going to go to in a second. And we've been kind of working through uh, Wise Men Seek Him. You had Pastor Howie ministered on gold and Pastor Michael on frankincense. Today we're going to be talking about myrrh. But I want to, I want to go back to the story in Matthew 2. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. So we see that when the wise men came to Jerusalem, it seemed that the whole city got upset. Now, King Herod, he was a king. So when the kingmakers show up from the east and say, hey, where's the new king that's born? That would make you nervous if you were a king. I, I could see a little bit of nerves there. But also, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have traveled just three people, like some believe. They would have traveled with a whole caravan, and they probably had a military escort for that kind of a journey. And if they were coming from Persia, they would have came in with the light infantry. And even the Romans feared the Persian light infantry because the Persian light infantry could pin down an entire Roman legion. So when they walked in Jerusalem, all of a sudden with this military force and these guys come in, everyone was a little bit on edge. What's going on? Are we being invaded? What's going on? It was certainly the talk of the town. So Herod called the meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? So all you religious scholars that weren't here at first service, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? Where in the Bible does it talk about that? Thank you. <laughs> Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephratath, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. So there was a prophecy back in Micah that talked about the ruler was going to come from Bethlehem or Ephrathath. I think one is house of bread, the other means fruitful. But we remember, if you go back to Genesis, that's where Rachel gave birth to Be Benjamin, and then she, she passed. She died in, in childbirth at that time. And I believe her tomb wasn't too far from there. But these kingmakers, or magos, magi, some say, uh, they were the astrologers, the seers, the sages, the sorcerers, maybe doctors, scientists of the day. Uh, it seems that if you remember Daniel, remember Daniel in the lion's den? Daniel was appointed the head of the magi. He looked to the one true God for wisdom, but many of them looked to their arts. Back even in, in, in Pharaoh's day with Joseph, he would have been appointed the head of the advisors when he was ascended to that position, when he ascended to second in command in all of Egypt. So the kings would always recognize these wise men. And, and you even see when Moses went into Pharaoh that Pharaoh called his sorcerers and his magi together so that they could try to replicate what Moses was doing in the name of God. So remember Moses threw down his staff and, and Pharaoh called his magicians and they turned their staffs into snakes too. But you see, Moses' staff ate up the other ones, signifying that the power of our God is greater than the power of their gods. Are we doing okay? But they brought three gri three three gifts. Here we go again. <laughs> Did that at first service too. Three gifts. Gold. It represented Christ as the King. Frankincense represented His deity or Christ as God. And myrrh, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more today, represented His humanity. It always was kind of symbolic of death and embalming or Christ as man. <clears throat> And if you look in the Old Covenant, myrrh was actually one of the main ingredients of the anointing oil that they used. So when they made it, myrrh was the, about half of the base, and then they used three other things when they made the anointing oil. But it's bitter to the taste, but the aroma is sweet and fragrant. And, and 
I find it very interesting personally, just a personal observation. Jesus went through a very bitter time from the Garden of Gethsemane to the cross when he gave up his spirit. It was a bitter experience for him. How many say if you were going to be crucified, that would be pretty bitter? But aren't you glad that he went through that bitter experience so that the fragrance or the aroma of freedom could come to us? Because really, the life that we have today, the forgiveness of sins that we have today, the power of God that we see in our life today, is because he was willing to endure that bitter time inside of his life. And then, in Jeremiah 29, 13, the Bible says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. And see, if we were to go back to Matthew 2 in the story... They asked, where is the Messiah to be born in Bethlehem, Judea? They said, for this is what the prophet wrote, and they quoted Micah. Herod called a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them at the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I too can go and worship him. <laughs> he wanted to worship him with a sword. After this interview, the wise men went their way and the star that they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem and they, it went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and bowed down and worshiped him. They opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then God warned them in a dream not to return the way that they came because they realized that Herod's intentions were maybe not pure. Which goes back to Jeremiah 29, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. See, God's the one that judges the motive of our heart. The wise men realized that Herod's motive was impure, so they left. And then Herod, when he realized that they left, what did he do? He went and he killed all the children in that region two years and under. Historically, if you read your Bible, you'll see that when Moses came forth as a great deliverer, the enemy tried to kill all the male children. When Jesus came forth, the enemy tried to kill the children. Today, around the nations of the world, the enemy is trying to kill the babies. Why? Because now in the new covenant, deliverers are being born every day. Because we have the same nature as Christ had to bring freedom to others. So every new life that comes in and gives their life to Christ is a deliverer that's going to drag people out of the kingdom of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of light. And you know, he said that, look for me wholeheartedly and you will find me, when the nation was going into captivity. I mean, Jeremiah was this prophet. Nobody wanted to listen to anything the guy had to say. But right before he says that, he goes into the very famous that most of you know, for I know the, the plans I have to you. Thoughts of good, not of evil, right? That's, that's what he's saying. They're getting captured. They're going into 70 years of captivity, but the prophet comes forth and says, but that's okay, I haven't forgotten you. There's, I've still got a plan for you, my people. And there's some of you here this morning that you're kind of in that contradiction where you know God has a plan for you, but it doesn't look like it when you look in the mirror every day. It doesn't look at it when you look at your circumstance. It doesn't look at it when you look at the situation you're in. But every situation is temporary and subject to change. So we, we've asked in response to this wise men's worshiping Jesus with the gold, the frankincense, and myrrh, Pastor Howie, a few weeks ago, he asked, where's your treasure? What do you do with your gold? In Matthew 6, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. Thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. I was thrilled to hear that we as a congregation took in over $30,000 to give to people that can't take care of themselves. I'm thrilled to hear that. I'm thrilled to hear some of the things that we do over 
at WLO and over at the women's homes, we're transforming lives. I'm thrilled to hear the testimonies of people that walk into the doors of this place. A guy I'd known for 20 years came up to me and he said, you know, the other day at an altar call, something snapped off my, I felt it snap, I felt it leave. Why? Because God came to bring freedom to people. But we're talking about treasure. So when Pastor Howie delivered the message on the gold, I was down in Florida enjoying some time off, sitting under the palm tree on the hammock by the pool. What, you never get vacation time? (laughs) But I bumped into some people down there. You remember these guys, Pastor Rick and Kathy? (laughs) So we decided to go for dinner one night, so we walked into this all-you-can-eat pizza buffet. Boy, my kids had a field day. My kids love that place. In fact, one of my daughters ate eight cinnamon rolls and then vibrated for three days. (laughs) When we, when I was down in Dallas, I made a pledge for this mission center that um, the school was gonna put up at CFNI. And I was a student, I was working, you know, midnights at the bank, and then I'd go to school during the day, and then I'd do my homework and go to the gym and maybe sleep a little bit in there. And from the time I made the pledge till December, at the end of the year when the pledge was coming up due, uh, I remember every time I'd get like a little bit of overtime or something, it was usually just to re- repair my car that broke. And in the beginning of December, I remember saying, God, like, I made this pledge. I really want to honor this. I made a commitment to this. And I I got this spirit-filled life Bible for making that pledge. I probably could have just bought the Bible and saved myself. But I had to, I really felt to take a step of faith. So I asked God, God, I need a way to make this happen. And then I went to lunch or dinner, and, and my buddy Rod sits down at the table with me, and we're talking. He goes, hey. Salvation Army just put me in charge of all the bell ringers. I want you to take your trumpet and work a couple shifts for me. Paid off my pledge. God didn't wave a magic wand and give me money, but he gave me the ability to go play my trumpet instead of ring a bell and, and, and make some money for Salvation Army. And I got paid to do that. And you know what? I paid off my pledge. God gives seed to those that desire to give. And then... So you know God has your heart because when things are something that he has given you and they flow freely into your hand and freely out of your hand, that's how we know. So that spiritual life Bible I was telling you about, there was a guy named uh, Wayne Myers. And he gave away 100% of what he made. Think about that. Yet he ate well, he always had cars, always had a roof over his head, always had clothes on his back but he gave away 100% of the money that he earned. And and when he would come and share and build faith with us, Wayne Meyer's week, everyone would pray and ask God to just, what do you want us to give away? I'm sure, Pastor Rick, back in that day, you would have really loved being down there with Pastor Kathy for that week. But he told me to give away my spirit-filled life Bible that I got for that pledge, so I gave the Bible away and a couple other things. I mean, got our stand. Here's how this works. Um, I had this leather coat before I went to school that I really liked, and there was a circle of friends we had, and there was this one person that always put my coat on every time we went somewhere. I'd take it off, they'd put it on. So one day I got to just give it. I was like, okay, here's my coat. So I went and bought myself another coat, before I went down to Dallas. Now, I didn't need a coat in Dallas, but I bought a coat anyway. And Wayne Myers week, sure enough, God said to give my coat away. And then, you know, fast forward, you don't need a coat in Dallas, you don't need a coat in the Philippines, it's hot. I came back and all my coats that I had left in my closet at my house ended up in benevolence when my parents moved and I came back and the whole church was wearing all my clothes. <laughs> So I meet my wife, she's not my wife at the time, and I say, hey, I need a winter coat. Why don't you come with me over to this place and we'll look for a coat? 
caught my wife. I, it took me 10 years to get a coat. I have a coat now. <laughs> but I really kind of feel that sewing those coats out made provision for God to bless me in other arenas of my life. See, obedience is really important. So do you own your stuff or does your stuff own you? Where's your treasure? Because it says, there the desires of your heart will be also, or also be. What aroma does your life offer? The sacrifice, the frankincense. Doesn't it say in Ephesians 5, 2, live a life filled with love? Following the example of Christ, he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us. And then he adds, a pleasing aroma to God. I believe this Christmas we can do this by operating in the love of God no matter what. I was talking to a guy just the other day. He doesn't even come to our fellowship. He's at another church. But I asked him how his Christmas, was he looking forward to Christmas? He said, not really. And I said, oh, do you mind if I ask why? He said, well, we have a really large family, but none of them get along. But they all get together in the same place and there's conflict the whole time they're together. And he goes, it's just not enjoyable. And I said, well, it's an opportunity for you to bring the peace of Jesus and the love of Jesus into a broken situation. So this Christmas, no matter what your situation is, whether it's a very positive, happy experience for you and your family, or where it's really negative and, and, and broken, let's just take the love of God that we have and carry it wherever we go and let the sacrificial choices that we make each day become an aroma of frankincense up to the Lord. Think about this. You know, I was driving the other day. God teaches me all kinds of things driving, especially patience. <laughs> and someone blew a, a yield sign. Apparently they didn't see it. It's a big red sign with... <laughs> So I had to brake really hard and kind of you hit your horn to let them know you're not happy. Maybe you don't. I did. She didn't like that, so she started waving at me in sign language. <laughs> and my daughter's sitting there in the passenger seat, Dad, am I supposed to wave back? <laughs> I said, no, we're not going to do that. And Daddy's not even going to get out of the car. See, it's an opportunity to grow in love. We have lots of opportunities to grow in love. But see, when the rubber meets the road, how do we respond? I can't say I always respond. I don't get out of the car, but I don't always respond as good as I would like. Man, driving down to Florida, I think I lost 42 minutes on the trip because of people on their phones at red lights or people going 40 in a 70. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> but see, when we go through experiences in life, if we sacrificially lay down our rights, peace will come. But too many times we want to go to war because we're right. And oftentimes you're so right, you're wrong. Because you may be correct in your approach and your conclusion, but you're wrong in your attitude. You're wrong in the outcome that you're trying to achieve. And see, when we pursue peace with everything that is within us, then we allow God to get involved and our life will be a pleasing aroma. Jesus willingly laid down his life. I assure you, all the armies in the world couldn't have put him on the cross if he didn't want to go there. Amen. My Bible says one angel came down and killed 180,000 soldiers in one night. One. Do you know how many angels Jesus had at his disposal? Yeah, what did he say, 12 legions? I think he could have took out the population of the earth, armed or not armed, a few times over if he wanted to. Trust me, they didn't put him there. He chose to go there. But that sacrifice that he was willing to endure became an aroma that we reap the benefit of today. And then I ask you for today's lesson on myrrh. 
Is the Holy Spirit active in your life bringing the anointing? One of my favorite verses to preach is Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. You see, the anointing produces something inside of our lives. Number one, the anointing gives us the ability to preach the good news to the poor. I don't know that it's even talking about just the poor as in people that don't have as much money as you do. I think it has to do with God blesses those who are poor in spirit and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. People that realize that they are spiritually bankrupt, that they have a great need for someone to take away their sin, that they need a savior. And God gives us this ability to bring the gospel, the good news, the message of hope to those that are lost, that are dying. I'm going to tell you, our world is desperate for the hope that you have. People are desperate to hear the good news that you know, that you have. And I'll challenge you, when the Holy Spirit is challenging you to share the good news that you've received with others, we need to be obedient. We need to be obedient to his promptings. We need to be obedient to his his leadings. The second thing that the anointing does is it produces or proclaims freedom to the captives. Since we've been united with him in death, we will also be raised to life as well. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We're no longer slaves to sin, for we died with Christ when we were set free from the power of sin. That's in Romans. When Jesus rose from the dead, his blood, very powerful, it released the captives. That means mind, body, spirit, if you're captive to something that's not Christ, you don't have to stay captive to it. He already made a way of freedom. There's an anointing present for the captives to become free. But what have we yielded our minds to? Because Too many Christians don't guard their eye gate and their ear gate, and they let all kinds of things in that God is not calling you to let in or telling you to let in, and then you become captive to something. You become slave to it. And when you're a slave to it, you're under its sway, its influence, and its power. But God only wants us to be subject to his power and captive only to his Holy Spirit. That's why Paul says, I'm a bondservant of Christ. I'm a willing slave of Christ. I want to do his will. But anything else, you don't have to be a slave to. So what has the enemy told you that you have to be a slave to because you don't have to stay a slave to it? Restoring sight to the blind. The anointing Restore sight to the blind. You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all? Mark 18. Seeing, they couldn't see, and hearing, they couldn't hear. See, the God of this world system, Satan, has blinded people to truth. Their eyes, they can't see truth. You ever talk to someone and you're proclaiming truth and they look at you and go, yeah, no. You know, they argue with you because they don't understand truth. They wouldn't know truth if it knocked them in the side of the head. But I'm going to show you something. Through prayer, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the anointing, you know, we worship God earlier. We sing, we enter into his presence. I preach the word of God to you a little bit. Hopefully, you'll put aside the busyness of the moment. Let the walls of your heart come down for a moment so that the spirit of God can do some work in there. But we pray and we ask the Holy Spirit to remove the blinders from people's eyes so that they can see truth. And that's what happened to each and every one of you that has acknowledged Jesus as your Savior. Because one day your eyes were opened, you realized, I'm a sinner, I need a Savior, and something changed. And you ran to the cross. And you surrendered your life to him willingly. Why? Because you realized your great need for the Savior. 
So we have to remember when we're interacting with people that are blinded to truth, it's through prayer and the Holy Spirit. I don't open anyone's eyes. I can't even debate someone's eyes open or preach someone. It's the Holy Spirit that opens their eyes and liberates people. Keep that in mind because sometimes we feel like we can do the Holy Spirit's job better than he can. It's his job to convict people of sin, not mine. That's a bonus for someone. Number four, the oppressed are liberated. Now, I'm going to read from you Isaiah 58. And no, I'm not calling us to a fast over Christmas. We're going to wait till Lent. But no, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. Keep reading, RJ. Keep reading. Did you see that one? Do not hide from relatives who need your help. Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. (laughs) Your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer, yes, I'm here. He will quickly reply, remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry, help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. Oftentimes, when we go against what God's telling us to do, we enslave ourselves. See, God has given us an anointing to liberate the oppressed, but we we become self-oppressors. We oppress ourselves. How do you do this? Well, if you allow resentment or bitterness in your life, you bring oppression into your life. If you allow yourself to stay in discouragement, guess what? You're going to bring some oppression into your life. When we gossip, we're bringing oppression into our life. So what happens is when we don't obey God, we bring these things into our life and we become a taskmaster or a slave to them. They become a taskmaster to us. And then you bring yourself willingly into bondage that Christ has liberated us from. It's very quiet. When Jesus went to the cross, he proclaimed that the oppressed are to be liberated. So why would we, who have freedom and the ability to liberate others, willfully allow ourselves to stay in bondage? That's why the Bible gives us the Word of God. That's why we've got to learn what the Word says. And it helps us I was talking about this a little bit earlier when we were talking about truth, but in the first service I referenced this. Because see, there's a spirit of truth and there's a lie. There's a spirit of error. And if you don't spend time in the Word, you're going to have a hard time telling the difference. You know, someone recently asked me about that book of miracles. What do you think about the Course in Miracles? And I said, well, which one? And they said, the one Oprah put out. I said, stay away from it. Well, why? Because you can't take truth from God's word and mix it with new age teaching and come up with some sort of a healthy hybrid. It doesn't work. The mixture's not good. We can't take truth from God's word and mix it with humanism and come to a healthy conclusion. You have to know the truth. That's why we spend time in the word of God. If you get rid of the unforgiveness and you spend time in the Word of God, you know, as a Christian, the Bible tells us if you don't forgive others, guess what? God's not going to forgive you. And he gives us all kinds of illustrations and parables about this. So we can forgive others, we can receive God's forgiveness, but we can't release that same forgiveness towards ourselves. That's interesting. Second Corinthians 1. All God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. 
and through Christ our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. It is God who enables us, along with you, to stand firm for Christ. He's commissioned us, he's identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he promised us. When you have the Holy Spirit as your guide, you will have the ability to stand firm on truth. If you look anywhere else besides the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, the Father for wisdom, you're not going to be able to stand firm despite what you face. And too many times we let our circumstances run over us when our circumstances, as I said earlier, they're only circumstances. They will change eventually if you want them to. You don't have to stay there if it's a negative one. You determine your destiny by your obedience. I want to put in oh, Ephesians 2.10, for we're God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So if God has a good plan for your life and he's made you his masterpiece, his special creation, he's made you unique, he made you on purpose, doesn't matter how you entered the planet, God knew you were coming and he's got a plan for you. That's right. Keep that in mind. That's good. But he made you a masterpiece. So when we as his masterpieces, each of us unique and individual, step into our role in the kingdom, we start operating in the authority that Christ has given us as image bearers and we reflect his glory to the world. And then people like you and me can go out into the culture and share the love of God with others with ease because we use the part of the image that he wants us to reflect and we show others what God wants us to show them and then they too will want the hope that you have. So... We have a service tomorrow, four and six, right? Mm -hmm. Invite your friends, invite your family. We're gonna change gears for the, the, we've been doing wise men seek him, right? And we've been talking about how we take the wisdom and we seek God through wisdom, applying the word of God to our life. We're taking wisdom, we're wise. You can have information, but if you never apply it, it's just that information. It'll never become wisdom in your life till you apply it. You only believe the parts of the Bible that you practice. In Luke 19, for the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. See, Christmas Eve is, he seeks us. We need to, we need to pursue him but he really pursued us because really I would have been lost and in trouble if Jesus never came and found me. Right. I wouldn't have found him. I could have wandered around forever looking for him, but I wouldn't have found him. But he found me because he knew exactly where I was. Right. He even knows how many hairs you have on your head. And some of you have to work harder for that than others. <laughs> so invite someone out on Christmas Eve. Ask the Holy Spirit, who he leads you to and who he wants you to encourage. We don't have to convict people of their sin to get them to come to church. Just invite them simply. It's going to be a fun night. It'll be about an hour, hour and seven minutes unless I talk a lot, but how often do I do that? Every now and again. But it'll move pretty good. You can come in with the kids. It'll be fun. They've got lots of actors and actresses and music and it, it'll be a fun night but we'll do a very short message about how Jesus seeks people. It'll be a good time. Then we'll go spend some time with our families so we can share the love of God and sacrificially bite our tongue a lot, right? Stand up with me, please. If you
you need a communion element, you can raise your hand. The ushers will help you with this. In Psalms 36, how precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. You feed them from the abundance of your own house, letting them drink from your river of delights. For you are a fountain of light, life, the light by which we see. You know, God's unfailing love, when you're in the light, it's easy to see because he illuminates your path. If you're not in light, if you're in darkness, you're not going to be able to see where to go. God has made a way. He's our fountain of life. He's the light by which we see. We know what to do. We know where to go in life because we have the creator who leads us. So as we come to the Lord's table, the bread which represents his brokenness, his broken body for our healing. So Father, I thank you that we as your people can come to the table to celebrate the goodness of God because you made a way because of your brokenness for us to have wholeness. Because of your sacrifice, we can have healing, mind, body, spirit. Restore us to wholeness now. We speak the life of God and all sickness and disease has to leave in the name of Jesus. We may partake of the bread. singing and worshiping today and we were singing that incredible song about how when Jesus walks into the room everything changes what we need to really grasp and understand inside our spirit is that that same spirit the same one, it dwells within us. It dwells within us. You know, I've heard so many people say and comment and talk about how, you know, um, being a Christian who actually practices what the Word of God teaches and says and living a life that's filled with holiness, well, that's just boring. What kind of fun are you going to have in life if you want to live a life like that? Well, I have a question for you. If Jesus himself, who is the epitome, the ultimate, the end, the beginning, the complete and total perfection of holiness, walked into this room, body, flesh and blood, and you were to spend the day with him, walking with him wherever he went. And when he walked into the room, everything changed. The dead began to rise. The sick were healed. The blind were made to see. The deaf were made to hear. Would you say that that's boring? Is that a boring life? I don't hear you. So that same spirit that is supposed to be inside of us as Christians is living and dwelling inside of us. But the key is that you have to be willing. We have to be willing. I have to be willing to submit with a heart fully totally, completely submitted to the Lord to serve my King, 
to serve with my whole heart. To be willing to be pressed, to be squeezed, for the character of God, that holiness to be developed inside of my life, that bitterness of the myrrh that has to be pressed and squeezed for that sweet aroma to come out. Character development, God working out his purposes inside of our life has to happen. And to that degree, that anointing flows in your life. That holiness flows in your life. Over these Christmas holidays, Pastor RJ was saying, we're going to have opportunity to go and see family. To walk into the room where we, with the power of God residing within us, can change everything. We are supposed to be able to walk into the room and the dead begin to rise. The blind see the broken, the hurting, healed. That's supposed to happen when we walk into a room with the Spirit of God in us. But to what degree are we willing to walk, to take up our cross and follow Him? Because that is the degree that we're going to see when he walks into the room, the spirit of God living in us, miracles begin to happen. The atmosphere changes when we allow the Holy Spirit to do his job. And we need to get out of the way. We need to get out of the way. Father, I thank you today that we, not lightly, remember what you did on the cross for us. The full measure of the wrath of God poured out on you so that I, so that we could all experience freedom. And then on the other side of that, Lord, I thank you that because of that death, new life comes. A life that's eternal, a life everlasting because of what you did. A sweet aroma, a fragrance. Father, I thank you that today, that you would minister inside of our hearts and help us to get out of the way. And let you, Holy Spirit, do your job. Work in us and through us to minister to those around us. Lord, I thank you that when we walk into the room, that we are not paralyzed by fear of man, but we are led and we are motivated by the love of God. And that when that love is in full and complete and total operation, all fear has to go and it can't remain. So I thank you, Lord, that during this season that we can be a vessel that you work through to bring hope, to bring healing, to bring love, to walk in compassion and to choose peace. To choose peace. To choose the relationship instead of choosing to be right. To choose that we humble ourselves and think about what you did for us. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us, that we choose to think of that and hold it in the highest. In Jesus' name.